place to wait for the big event to happen, let's say. And, you know, meeting my baby sister for the first time, all of that, I don't have any recollection of, of, of that. But what I do know is that I was looking at the stars together with my grandmother. And I asked her the question, grandmother, what are these stuff? What are they made of, these lights that I see? And what she said to me is, well, those are little holes in, 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 the, in the universe. And those little holes allow the people that love you to look through them and, and shield you from any harm. And for example, to guide your mother now, who's in, in birth, delivering your baby sister. Um, and of course, I mean, I was barely three years old. I completely bought the story and I thought, ah, yeah, that should be it. But this, this question of what is out there, what is the universe made of, has never let me go. And as I grew older, I actually discovered that the question, what is the visible stuff made of, is not so interesting. The real interesting question is, what is the invisible stuff made of? So why do I say that? Well, um, there are reasons to believe, and I will also explain in this talk why we think that. Um, that only 50% of everything, all meta content that we know in the universe is actually made of stuff that we can see, is made of ordinary matter. Another staggering amount of 85% is put in a form that we know nothing about, it only has a label. The label is dark matter because we cannot see it. And in this talk what I want to do is I want to explain to you why we exactly know what dark matter must be at the same time, we really don't know what we are exactly we are looking for. And this is, of course, a very confusing statement, but um, allow me some time to, uh, to explain this to you. And to explain this, I want to go back even further in time to the year 1933. Because in that year, a Bulgarian uh, astronomer called Fritz Zwicky published his research on clusters. So what is a cluster? A cluster is a, a gravitationally bound object of galaxies like our own Milky Way and dust, so interstellar dust. Um, and what you can do with such a cluster, well, it's gravitationally bound, which means that all of these objects, both the, the, the galaxies and the gas, they rotate around a common center, the center of this cluster. And what Brit Fritz did is he observed a, a collection of such clusters and he measured two things. First of all, the vol individual velocities of these galaxies, so how, with what speed they rotate around this common center. And then secondly, the amount of light that the cluster is emitting. So why is this second observation important? Well, the amount of light that a cluster emits tells you something about the amount of mass that there is in a cluster and hence about the, the, the size of the gravitational pull that every object experiences. And this gravitational pull is what you need to, um, to keep these objects in order, so um, in orbit, sorry. So if you think about the time that you were in a carousel, uh, you have to roll, hold on pretty tight because if you won't, you will fly out of the carousel like this hamster is doing with this, this, this spinning wheel. So what was now the observation? Well, he had these two things. He had the, the velocities of the, of the galaxies and he knew the amount of matter and therefore the amount of, of gravitational pull all of these gravities, all of these galaxies experiences. And the thing is that this gravitational pull is just not large enough. So he said, well, it's not happening, but I, if I just look at the measurements, there is not enough mass to explain the, the speed of these, of these galaxies. So this research was published in 1933, but he was not believed. And the reason for that is a bit funny. This guy was seen as a complete madman. He was not, he, he didn't have the kind of personality. He would yell at his students. And if you didn't agree with him, he would yell at you for not believing him. So when this research was put out, so he, he postulated the existence of, an, of a new form of matter, which he called dark matter, but people just didn't believe him. 
And this is the reason that it actually kept quiet for t quite some time until the year 1978. Because in that year, a uh, American astronomer called Vera Rubin and her team, she published similar results, but now not in clusters, so these very large objects, but in individual galaxies. So let's look at what she did. In an individual, in a galaxy, a galaxy itself, like I said, like our Milky Way, this is made out of stars and again dust. And what she did is she measured the velocities of individual stars as a function of the radius of, of the distance that they have towards the center of the galaxy. You can predict also, so what you see here is precisely this curve. And don't worry, this is the only plot that I'm going to show you throughout the entire talk. But what you see here is the circular velocity that these uh, stars have in their galaxy as a function of this radius. And then you see two curves. First of all, you see this one. And this one is the one that we predict using the, the normal theory of gravity. So the Einstein theory of gravity, which on these large scales is actually the same as Newton's theory that we, you know, you've learned about in high school. And then secondly, we see this curve. And this is a fit through data, the black data points. And what you see directly is that there is quite some discrepancy with, between what we predict and what we observe. So to just put that in a bit of a different way, left is what we see and right is what we expect to see. It's very clear from this movie that what we see is that a galaxy is rotating just too fast. We don't, uh, just on the, on the amount of sorry, on the amount of visible light that such a, class, uh, such a galaxy is emitting, we won't expect such, to see such high velocities. So what is going on here? Well, at this point, there are two explanations. Either this prediction that comes out of normal gravity um, theories is completely wrong, or there is a halo of mass surrounding us, which we cannot see. This halo at this point doesn't need to be extraordinary. It can be anything. It can be um, just stars that have died that are not emitting anymore. It can be black holes, but it doesn't need to be a new form of matter. These two observations alone are not enough to tell you that. But this changed dramatically in the year 1992, because in this year, a very special picture was made, which is this one, and what you're looking at is the birth picture of our universe. So this birth picture, what you're seeing is the afterglow of the Big Bang. Um, we knew that that existed because that actually was found already in uh, 1965. And this is a bit of a funny story, so I want to tell you something about that. Um, what you see here is a radio antenna, and this was built originally to um, have a, a way of communicating for the military service and later it was also used for commercial ends um, but in the year 1965 th this thing became obsolete and then there were a few scientists that said oh but we can actually use this for science so these two guys that that thought of that were uh, Penzias and Wilson and what they wanted to do with this telescope is they wanted to aim it at the night sky and they wanted to have a radio spectrum of stars but when they tried to do that, they couldn't get rid of some background noise that they had. At first I thought, okay, maybe this background noise is, is caused by, by, by people. So they pointed the telescope towards New York Center to just see whether, you know, this noise follows some pattern. If there's more people, maybe there's more noise. But that turned out not to be quite true. The noise is, is entirely isotropic. It's the same from all directions. And then they thought, oh, but it, we must get rid of this because we cannot use this telescope to have this nice radio spectrum of the stars. So they went and take a look inside this telescope and what they actually found was a group of pigeons that was breeding in there. And um, I guess everybody who owns a car knows that pigeons can make quite a mess. It was quite dirty inside the telescope and they had to get rid of the pigeons because surely they must create this background noise. Um, so they tried everything. They tried to put on some loud music to scare them off. They had even these fake predatory birds that circled around. 
But nothing helped, the pigeons wouldn't, uh, wouldn't fly away. And in the end, what they did is they got out their shotgun, killed all pigeons that were inside, cleaned the entire horn, but the background noise was still there. Well, at the same time, there was uh, a theorist, uh, Dick, his name was, and he was about to publish a paper on an afterglow that should be a remnant from the Big Bang. It should be a sign that the Big Bang had happened. And Wilson knew about this, so he contacted uh, this theorist, and then together they actually found, oh, but what we're seeing is the afterglow, is the evidence for the Big Bang. Okay, so in 1965, we already knew that this afterglow was there, but then in 1992, uh, this picture came. Why is this so special, and what does it tell us about dark matter? Well, this picture is actually the reason why I say 85% of the matter content of the universe is unknown. I don't have the time now to go into details, but this is the picture why we say this is true. And if you want to ask me about that, you can do, uh, we have some time after the talk to talk about that. What you see here uh, in these different colors are dens density fluctuations. So there's an over density here, an under density there. So what has happened since this, this picture was, well, since this radiation was formed, since then, the universe grew older, stars have formed, and from these galaxies and planets have formed until the present day. I mean, if we look at our universe, we don't see this, this nice uni uh, isotropic afterglow. No, what we see is, is over densities and under densities. We see these, these structures and we see large chunks of empty space. So how did this process happen? How do we get from this, this nice uniform picture of small fluctuations, small over densities and under densities to the universe that we know today? Well, that happens via a process that we call structure formation. And we can actually model this structure formation using uh, computer simulations. And one of such computer simulations you can see right here. So we start off with an almost isotropic distribution of matter, almost uniformly distributed, and then we put on the time. And what we see is that these, these lumps of, of particles, they start falling into each other and they, they start to form. I ah, okay, I can continue, I guess. No, nah, that's no worries. I thought you would like it. Um, so we have these, this, this nice, I will start the, the uh, movie again. We had this nice uni isotropic uh, distribution. We let time run, we let the universe grow older, and then we see structure forming. But where do we need dark matter in this story? Well, actually to form all of these structures. Because if dark matter wouldn't exist, these structures cannot form. Because what happens is these dark matter is massive, so it creates gravitational wells. And these gravitational wells are allowed to get very deep for normal metal to fall in and form all of these structures that we see. And without dark matter, actually the, the universe wouldn't be old enough for us to see clusters, for us to see galaxies or stars. Maybe a few stars would have been there, a few galaxies would have been there, but that's it. And dark matter plays a crucial role in understanding the evolution of our universe. So in 1992, the, um, let's say, hypothesis of all of this being explained by just a modified theory of gravity became harder. So it's still possible to explain all of this data saying, oh, my theory of, of my Einstein theory of gravity is wrong, but it's more plausible that all of this is explained by a new exotic type of matter, something that really doesn't behave like uh, the matter that we know. But I'm not done gathering the evidence, because in 2006, a very special piece of evidence uh, came our way, so to say, which came in the form of the bullet cluster. Um, and the bullet cluster is actually not one cluster, but two, and it's a colliding uh, 
those two clusters are colliding. And what has happened is, again, I remind you, the cluster exists of, of uh, galaxies and gas. So these galaxies, they are very dense, they are packed together, but they are also, there are not so many of them. So if two of those clusters collide, what happens with the galaxies, is they just fly through each other. And this is precisely what has happened with these two objects. So what you see here, you just have to believe me, are two um, uh, used to be bound clusters. And here you see the, the galaxies themselves. But there's also this gas. The gas, of course, is not visible in uh, in normal light. But if I if I look at this system with a Röntgen telescope, then I can see the gas. And you see this gas has nicely clumped together in the middle. And this you can uh, understand very well because if, for example, you would splash two water droplets together, you can see they stop in the middle. And in the same way, the gas of these these two colliding clusters has stopped in the middle because it's so interacting, it's so dense, it will just collapse. Now, this system was already known in 2006, but what was done in 2006 is that the, the mass distribution of this system was um, analyzed. And usually the gas is the more massive component of, of a cluster, so what we would expect is that the majority of the mass would sit also here, right in the middle. But that's not quite true, because if I draw in the mass distribution in blue, this is what I find. The majority of the mass is placed on the outskirts of this system. So that means that in this collision, there is some mass that doesn't feel any interaction, just follows, goes through each other, and then, yeah, like these galaxies continue keep, continues the movement. But this is a bit weird to explain because I just told you that this 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 gas is way more massive than all of these these uh, galaxies. And a way to explain this is by introducing dark matter. Dark matter is a, a particle that doesn't interact, that doesn't feel that doesn't behave the same way as these water droplets, but really just flies through each other. We're almost there with gathering the pieces of evidence because the last one came in 2019. And this is a really funny piece of evidence because in 2019, we actually found galaxies that don't have dark matter. And now would you say, well, you don't find dark matter, you find evidence of galaxies that actually don't need this explanation of, of missing mass. And you're telling me that that's that is something that speaks in favor of dark matter. How can that be? Well, the reason is the following. I just told you about these, uh, this structure formation, the simulations that we have. So in these simulations, there are also galaxies that should exist without any dark matter. We predict that these objects should be there. So actually not having these objects until 2019 was an issue for the dark matter um, hypothesis as it being a new particle candidate. However, in 2019, a series of papers came out. So these are the first two, but there were a couple of more um, that have been published that said, okay, but now we've found galaxies where this rotation curve perfectly follows the one that we predict from, uh, from Newtonian gravity. So, you know, not finding dark matter speaks in favor of dark matter in this case. So we have all these pieces of the puzzle. What is then dark matter? Dark matter is simply the name that we give to the, to the explanation to all of this data. But with that, I mean, it's a bit of an unsatisfactory answer. We know exactly what dark matter must be. It's the thing that explains all of this data. But then what is it? <laughs> you know, It's not really an answer to my, my question, what is dark matter? Um, I started this talk by telling you that 15% of all of the matter content of the universe is ordinary matter, and then we have this 85%, which is dark matter. Let me now explain to you why we have the separation between ordinary matter and dark matter. Well, that comes as follows. Ordinary matter can be summarized in a model that we call the standard model. And the standard model contains some, some particles, and these few amount of particles 
make up everything that you see around you. So they make up the screen that you're looking at right now, or the chair that you're sitting on, on the jacket that you're wearing. All of this is made out of ordinary matter. And in the Stenel model, we have uh, the quarks, we have leptons, we have gauge bosons, and then we have the Higgs boson, which was found in 2012, and is responsible for the masses of all of these particles. So why doesn't dark matter fit into this story? Well, let us summarize what the properties of dark matter are. First of all, from all these pieces of the puzzle, we know that it doesn't emit light. I mean, it's dark, otherwise we would have seen it. So every particle that emits light in the standard model, we should just cross out. And secondly, it has to be stable. It has to be stable because we know structure formation needs dark matter, and in that process, it cannot just decay. So every par particle in the standard model that decays, we should also cross that one out. Thirdly, it cannot be strongly coupled. So it, can be, it cannot be strongly coupled for, uh, to explain this, this cosmic microwave background. So this is this afterglow of the Big Bang. Uh, for the structure formation, it needs uh, not to be strongly coupled, but also to explain something like the bullet cluster. It needs to be very, very, very weakly interacting. So then we cross out the gluon, which is strongly coupled, and that leaves the neutrinos. However, the issue with the neutrinos is that they are very light. And the fourth requirement for dark matter is that it needs to be slow enough. Again, otherwise these structures couldn't be formed. So that also crosses out the, dark mat uh, the neutrinos as being a dark matter candidate. So what we've just done is we've gotten rid of all particles that we know of. None of them are a suitable dark matter candidate. But then what is dark matter? We still don't have an answer to this question. Well, for that we have a theorist to the rescue, because although we don't know what it is, we have many ideas of what it could be, and this just gives you sort of an overview of the, the, the kinds of ideas that are out there. Um, neutrinos is in there very prominently, but note that these are not just the standard model neutrinos, but really an extension of that. Um, we have new particles at the so-called weak scale, so these are uh, lighter particles, the, the what Peter just mentioned, supersymmetry is also in there. Uh, we have very exotic names like Wimpsilla and Machos. Um, so yeah, we have we have ideas of what it could be, but the, the question is, what is it? And maybe it's not even true that it's just one of these, these uh, proposals, but a combination. Maybe we have an entire dark sector, like a new dark standard model um, that we're looking for, but we really don't know that. Um, in, the rest of my talk, I will focus on dark matter being a particle, a new type of particle. But a dark matter park is not complete, in my opinion, if I also tell you that there are also people working on this, this modified theory of gravity. So, like I said, dark matter as a particle candidate is the most uh, attractive explanation of all of these pieces of the puzzle. But that doesn't mean that the other one is wrong. It can still be that the laws of gravity, as we've written down uh, right now, are wrong, but there hasn't been formulated a new theory that can explain all of this data simultaneously. But there are definitely people working on that as well. Um, so, for the remaining part, I will focus on uh, dark matter being a particle, and I will focus on the question, how can we search for something that is invisible? How can we find an answer to the question, what this dark Thing is. So on Earth, we do that in three possible ways. And these three possible ways can all be summarized by looking at this diagram. So what you see here is an interaction between ordinary matter, this uh, happy pink particle, and dark matter. And we can look at this diagram in three different ways. The first way is if we just read it from left to right. And in that case, we're talking about direct detection of dark matter. And what happens there is, so if dark matter is, is a particle, it's everywhere, also here on Earth. And depending a bit on the interaction strength, so how, how um, strongly it couples to ordinary matter, so it has to be very weakly, maybe it couples just slightly to ordinary matter, and depending on this interaction, your own body interacts 
between 1 and 10 times with a dark matter particle every year. Well, if your own body is doing that, then surely a detector can do that as well. And how does such an interaction look like? Well, we have a dark matter that comes out of the universe flying into some atom that sits here nice, uh, peacefully on Earth. It hits this thing and then it flies off. How we see that in a detector is that some matter starts moving out of nowhere. Because this dark matter is, in principle, you cannot see this. And precisely for these kinds of, of events, deep underground experiments are looking for. So one example is uh, the Xenon experiment, which is uh, situated in Italy. And you see a picture of that one right here. Um, these are placed in deep, deep, deep underground laboratories because, of course, dark matter is not the only particle that can just fly in, hit an atom, and then fly off again. For example, uh, neutrinos, we, we, we saw them before, also these neutrinos, they can fly in our detector, hit a particle, and then fly off again. And to really make sure that this, this recoil is induced by a dark matter candidate, um, we need to know the background really well and we need to be able to shield the detector from all of these violent things uh, as well. But this is the first type of detection that we're using to try to figure out what this dark matter is. The second type of uh, detection is called production, and this is obtained by reading this diagram from bottom to top. So particle dark matter production happens in, uh, in particle colliders, and the biggest one to date is called the Large Hadron Collider. So here you see a picture of the, of the landscape. It's situated between Switzerland and uh, France, near Geneva. So here you see the Geneva Lake, and this, this cloud is actually the jet d'eau. And it's an enormous circular ring, so it's 27 kilometers. And through this ring, particles, protons, are being accelerated. And I say it's enormous. I mean, if we place this uh, on top of the of the Twente University, I could get a ring like that. It's it's really big. Um, I once, by the way, cycled all the way. I mean, you can cycle through the the country side, and it's it's a fun trip to do. But that's a side story. Um, so, like I said already, we are circling around protons and we're bringing them to a collision to one into one of our detectors. And such a collision is essentially different than a collision that you know out of daily life, let's say. So these particles, they have a humongous amount of energy. And if you smash two particles together with such a high amount of energy, these particles can transform into other particles. So it's not like um, if, you, uh, if you collide two cars together that you get all pieces of the cars. No, this really transforms into another particle. And these particles that are being formed by smashing ordinary matter together, you can measure in these detector detectors. And these include stuff like uh, protons, electrons, photons, and maybe if you're lucky, if you do this often enough, also dark matter. But then becomes the question, okay, I'm smashing together these, these, these particles, um, but this dark matter, I've just told you, this is very weakly interacting. So how can I observe something that doesn't interact my, with my detector? Well, for that, uh, nature has a, has a very powerful principle. Because for these kinds of collisions, there's one thing that needs to be satisfied, which is the conservation of energy and momentum that the system had before collision and after the collision. So this is a, this is an, uh, a sum that should be equal to, to each other. And if that's not the case, I know that I'm missing something. And uh, that something might be dark matter. But, so, imagine I would, I would see such an event and I would, I would observe that there is an energy imbalance between what I put in and what I get out. Of course, dark matter is not the only type of particle that I cannot detect. Another type that I cannot detect is the neutrino. So how do I distinguish whether it was a dark matter candidate or whether it was a neutrino? Well, that's that's an extremely difficult question. 
And for that, again, you need to know your, your so-called background really well. You need to know um, what the standard model predicts in terms of rates um, and also what your new model predicts. So that's also why there are so many different types of, of dark matter models. They all predict different rates for the amount of dark matter that you're going to see in such a detector. Um, and this helps you to understand your data a little bit better. So we had two directions of this diagram. The last direction is if you read it from uh, top to bottom. And in that case, you're talking about indirect detection. Because surely if you can annihilate, if you can collide two ordinary matter particles onto each other and let them form dark matter, then a reverse process is also possible. And indeed, that turns out to be true in our models. Um, and this happens in areas where the amount of dark matter is really large. So think about the center of our sun, the center of the galaxy, um, center of dwarf galaxies, like really dense, gravitationally dense objects. There, the amount of dark matter is a lot higher. The velocities of this dark matter is a lot higher, and they can actually smash together and form ordinary matter particles. And this, I mean, we can point our telescopes at the center of the sun, for example, and we can measure the amount of, of, of ordinary matter particles that we see. But of course, dark matter is not the only particle that is doing this. Also, standard model particles are creating these, these, uh, uh, these observations. So again, to know whether you had dark matter causing an, an, a certain amount of protons or ordinary matter causing a certain, certain amount of protons. For that, you again need very accurate background predictions. But these are the three ways that we are using to uh, get an answer to this question, what is dark matter? And these can be summarized in, uh, in this map that we have of, uh, of the Earth. So you see all experiments here that are currently looking for dark matter. Um, there are tens of thousands of scientists working on this issue. But I have to disappoint you because dark matter still hasn't been found. We still don't know what this particle is. And the reason for that is, well, I've told you that this, this diagram essentially says all ways in which we are looking for dark matter. But if this interaction between dark matter and ordinary matter does not exist, then all of these experiments have no chance of finding it because they really rely on this principle. However, it's really important not to give up this search. Even if this turns out to be true, if, even if the interaction strength between ordinary matter and dark matter is almost zero or dark matter is not a particle at all, we need to know that. And the only way to know that is to do these experiments. And a null result is just as valuable as well, of course, I would like to find dark matter, but also knowing that it was not in that place is also very val valuable to know. Nowadays, also new techniques are being used, like um, a lot, uh, a technique that is really new and is sort of propagating into this field is uh, the use of machine learning, because machine learning can allow you to uh, to understand your backgrounds better and I hope, I hope I made it clear that knowing your background is really crucial to also finding a piece of the signal. Um, but it's really important, even with these null results, to not give up the search and uh, keep looking for this question, because it's 85% that we're missing and that we want to have an answer to. And with that, um, I will open the floor to questions. Okay, Melissa, thank you very much for your... Um intriguing talk yeah i really enjoyed it um, you started with uh, with the hamster spinning on the spinning wheel who uh, flew flew out of it you had a nice nice historical uh, evidence overview with your uh, anecdote about the pigeons in the huge telescope that was very nice um, to hear about about this um, you talked about all circumstantial evidence for um, dark uh, matter it was very interesting um, dark perhaps there's a dark standard model i have some we have some questions about uh, that as well um and you said that every year 10 dark matter particles might touch your body did i understand that correctly yes uh -huh. you understood that correctly. that's a fascinating idea that's 
this weird substance is also here on Earth and touching our bodies without noticing, of course, but it's very, uh, very intriguing. Um, Melissa, we have a couple of questions uh, in the chat. I had a few myself. Let's, let's start with a very uh, practical question. It's in the chat. It's by Armored Space Pony. That's what his name is. I think it's a very good name. Um, <laughs> what are some of the practical implications of finding out more about dark matter? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, of which the answer is, I don't know. Melissa, I mean, you, you just appeared from the screen. I now see Melissa van Beekveld. Your, your video is lost somewhere. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, uh, you're back. Yeah, you're back. You're back again. Sorry. Yeah, it's nice to see you uh, talk. The practical implications, <laughs> please go ahead. Yes. Well, if you're looking uh, for um, in 50 years, we will be able to uh, make a car run on dark matter. I mean, that's something I, I cannot I cannot tell you. The practical implications, more directly, would be um, for this for these kinds of experiments. A lot of technology is needed. So, for example, uh, I've already mentioned this this development of machine learning in the field. We're really it, it is a constant back and forth between computer scientists on one hand and physicists on the other hand. That you know, we tell them, okay, your algorithm that you have developed it could benefit if it could also do this and this and this. And then they go back and they try. Um, I can give you a very concrete example, actually. Um, so Google uses algorithms to uh, recognize faces and, and Facebook does the same. We are using similar algorithms to uh, uh, distinguish this, this, to get out this meta distribution that we have. So remember I showed you this example of the bullet cluster of this meta distribution. So we do that with a technique that's called gravitational lensing. Really complicated to do that using computer simulations. But once you have those computer simulations, you can actually just feed them to a machine learning algorithm. And then this algorithm is going to sort out for you how exactly the dark matter, how the matter is distributed. So these mm -hmm. are more, I mean, it's not directly a practical um, outcome of dark matter itself, but the research that we do for dark matter certainly has, has applications in us, in our society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's a very good uh, answer. I hope the armored space pony is uh, is satisfied with the answer. Um, now we have another interesting question by uh, Hans Speck. He is wondering, and that's a very interesting theme, um, is there any interaction between dark matter and dark energy? And before diving into this question, perhaps you could, could say something about dark energy, because um, how is the, the, the pi... Um, distributed. I think there's even more dark energy in the universe than dark matter. Could you could you say a few words about this, the relation between the two? Yes. Um, well, it it completely depends um, on your model. So let me first explain what why we need dark energy. Um, if we look at our universe, what we are actually seeing is that everything around us is going further and further away from us. So you can think about that as, uh, I don't know whether you've ever baked a piece of bread and you have these um, raisins into them. Mm -hmm. and if you're baking it, it, it starts expanding. But if you would be on such a raisin, what you would see is that every raisin is just flying away from you. And this is exactly the situation that we're in right now in our universe. Every, every other universe, uh, sorry, every other galaxy, other cluster is just going away from us. To explain this, um, actually Einstein put in a term in his equation that had a negative energy sign. So it's not behaving like, so the, the, the names are similar, dark energy and dark matter. They don't have a relationship. Dark energy is really a, a term that you have to put into the equations that behaves fundamentally different as matter. That's why it's called dark energy. It has a, a, a negative sign, let's say. Um, but there are theories that link them. Um, and these are these go into the directions of these, these modified theories of gravity that say, okay, but this expanding universe 
dark matter is a consequence of that. It seems as though we need more matter, but actually that's not the case at all. It's it's the universe trying to trick us. But in like the standard model of cosmology, those two things are completely separate and they have nothing to do with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and one question which popped up in my mind, um, I learned when I did physics uh, at the university that um, Einstein says that mass and energy are equivalent in our ordinary world. Could you say that mass, dark mass and dark energy are also equivalent or that's complete nonsense? Nope, I have to... Uh, actually, it's a bit funny. Uh, I once corrected this on the Wikipedia page because on Wikipedia they said, ah, the dark, mat dark energy can easily be be explained once we know what dark matter is because mm -hmm. indeed we have this nice equation of Einstein but this dark this equation of Einstein really only holds for matter mm -hmm. if you have matter then there is a relationship between the mass of a particle and the energy of a particle those can be that's actually also the reason why we can convert like in this collision of the LHC of the Large Hadron Collider we can convert particles into other particles well, that's because we're actually just transferring energy and it's finding, finding some ground state, state and that's then a new particle. Um, dark energy is, it, it doesn't follow the laws of matter. Mm -hmm. And we call it dark energy because it's also something dark and something we don't know anything about. And it's a misleading name um, because indeed dark matter and dark energy, oh, it's, it's, it's easy to think that those who should be related mm -hmm. but dark energy is really just a sign that we need in the equations dark matter is a new form of matter it behaves the same way as as standard well it it follows the same evolution equations as um ordinary matter but it's not ordinary matter so mm -hmm. what is it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah okay thanks thanks for clearing uh, this up um melissa in one of your schemes i was fascinated um, you had a whole tree of all kind of uh, explanations for dark matter. Uh, I also saw the um, uh, modified theory of gravity. And that's, yes. I find, particularly interesting because uh, once we had in our science cafe, which is also part of Stum Gerade, we had Erik Verlinde. Yeah, there it is. Uh, and on the left you see the modified gravity. And then you see the emergent gravity. And perhaps you know Erik Verlinde. You know him, of course, I, uh, I think. And he has an alternative theory uh, for gravity and he also states that dark matter dark er energy is not necessary anymore to explain things because he has a new theory perhaps you can say a few words about his theory do you know Erik Verlinde and his theory and what do you uh, think yes. about it what, what, what do um, you think about his theory well I think um, so all of the signs that we have point into the direction dark matter is a new type of particle, but the universe may very well be fooling us. And I mean, this 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 thing that he wrote down, it's it's extremely bright. It's I mean, it's something that that's fundamentally new. It's challenging the ways that we think about gravity, about dark matter, about the dark energy, everything. So um, it's an interesting theory. However, it only explains these rotational curves. It doesn't explain uh, why we have this, this, this uh, after, how, why this form of the afterglow of the Big Bang looks like that, or how we have this structure formation. It doesn't explain that. So, I mean, I cannot say it's right or wrong, but what I can say is that at this point, it's not mature enough to, to yeah, to be taken over as the as the new paradigm, let's say. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's really interesting. Yeah, it's very exciting physics, of course. And it's, I, I, what I really like about this whole field of science is that everyone is yeah, actually gro groping in the dark, but everyone has his own theory and we're all together there trying to solve this incredible difficult puzzle. And I think all efforts are important to, to see what ways are uh, the good ways and, and what not. So that's a very nice combination. Uh, let me see. Okay. There are, are a couple of more questions. Um, uh, we had this one by Hans Peck. Um, Hans Peck has another question. Are dark matter particles too small to detect while, while they have mass? They're too small. Could you? Well, small, like the size of a 
particle. Um, a particle is a point object. It has no size. But what it does have is a mass and an interaction. And what we actually, we measure the size between quotes of particles by uh, this interaction strength. So if a particle is very heavily interacting, um, then the size is large. That means it's easy to see. Um, it can be indeed that the interaction strength is almost zero. And in that case, the size, then we would indeed say the size is too small to see. Um, and yes, that, that could definitely be true. It could be that uh, the dark matter is not so... I mean, to, to fit in these, mod in, um, in these models that we have, it needs to be interacting a little bit. Otherwise, we cannot explain uh, this data. Um, but how much exactly it, it has to interact and also how heavy it should be. I mean, we have theories that predict a very, very, very light type of, of dark matter. Think of, you know, uh, 100, no, not even, 1 millionth the, the mass of a proton towards 10 times the mass of the sun. All of these, this, this entire mm -hmm. mass range we have dark matter candidates in. Um, yeah. It could be anything. <laughs> yeah. Incredible, uh, very, very nice. And and um, I, I looked up to prepare to prepare prepare for this lecture, um, and I found the very nice term called WIMPs, which is an abbreviation for weakly interacting massive particles. Is that a standard term in your field of expertise? The WIMPs. Yes, definitely. I okay. I think that uh, WIMPs are at this point. So the. I have to phrase this correctly. The most of the people are, are, if you would place a bet, if you would say, okay, where would you place your money? I think most people would put it on wimps. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that there is some very nice mechanism for wimps that, if you put in a new type of particle that doesn't interact very strongly, it's weakly interacting, but also massive, then you can explain all of this data very between quotes naturally. And this is why, uh, actually, also the majority of the experiments are focusing on finding signs of these WIMPs. I see. Um, Supersymmetry is a theory that also predicts uh, a WIMP candidate. So even within this class, you you have different types of theories. Um, indeed, supersymmetry is one of the theories that ex that that predicts a WIMP particle. But I mean. It's just one type of, of, of new particle that we have, one type of particle that could predict dark matter. And um, although I, I would certainly place my money on that, it doesn't mean that that needs to be true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, we have another intriguing question by Daniela P07. Um, gravity curvature, it's about gravity curvature, uh, looks the same with or without dark matter? So what's the influence of uh, dark matter on gravity curvature? Could you say something about that? Um, it depends a little bit on what is meant, but I guess uh, gravity curvature as in I'm looking at the center of the universe and um, my light is being bent in a certain way. Well, that definitely looks different if I have dark matter because if I have more dark matter, that means that the gravitational well... So you can think about placing a ball on a trampoline. If you're doing that, the trampoline is curved. The same thing happens with space-time. Space-time is a, is, a, is a mathematical formulation, actually, to describe the things that we see around us. But if we place more matter in space-time, then the space-time gets curved. Again, think about this trampoline. Um, then light, it behaves in a funny way, because what light wants to do is... it. Light is lazy. It wants to take the short path towards the observer, towards you. And that's actually not right through the center. No, it's avoiding this deep, deep well that there is, because otherwise it also has to climb up again. No, I will just go around it. And that's what light does in the presence of, of a lot of mass. And indeed, if there's more dark matter, there's more curvature. Mm -hmm. But definitely plays a role there. Yeah. OK. Good question and a clear, uh, clear answer. Um, then we have um, Joshua Bowiwani, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, and he, he states, uh, since dark matter has mass, uh, can the Higgs effect influence it? Yes, definitely. Um, one of the searches, both um, 
at these Large Hadron Collider. So w when we found uh, the Higgs boson, it's not only that we found the Higgs boson, also that gave us a new way to look for dark matter. Because now we have indeed a new particle that interacts with mass. Clearly dark matter has to be massive. So maybe if we, if we just look, if we observe the Higgs boson um, closely enough, if we inspect that thing closely enough, maybe one of the decay products of, dark, of, of the Higgs boson can be dark matter. The issue there is though that um, if, I mean, I tell this story as though the uh, Higgs boson can decay and then we can just very cleanly observe these decay products, but that's not true. It's really a violent uh, environment and you need to uh, figure out what the background is very well. You need to understand everything that's going on. Also, um, your detector can in some places be broken, so also that you need to model very correctly. But um, yeah, the the interaction with Higgs and dark matter is definitely something that uh, that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're almost running out of time, and we have to. We have a very practical issue here in this building because we have to leave the building because of the curfew. But we have still some time for a couple of questions. Um, uh, Daniel Borjwani, who is probably a, a, a family of uh, Joshua, he has another question, could dark matter actually be an intrinsic property that manifests into a mass when detected, just like inertia or charge? That's also a very intriguing question. Thanks, Daniel. Yes. Melissa, what, what? This is the, well, it's not the idea of, of uh, Eric Verlinde, but this goes into that direction. Mm -hmm. Because what he says is that um, mass is something that is emergent and indeed it, it it looks like if I I am observing something I'm actually observing mass. No, it's not true. What you're what you're observing is some some curvature of space time. Um, so with that I mean mm -hmm. it's definitely the idea that people are looking at. It could be that we're all fooled. <laughs> it's still again I have to say it's difficult to explain all of these measurements by having a theory like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And one final question I had myself when I was preparing this. Um, I always learned at FISIC that mass clumps together. We can see it in the universe because all planets are, are solid objects and, and there's empty space in between. Um, I believe the black matter doesn't clump together. Um, maybe, why not? That not that weird? Because it is mass, it attracts ordinary mass. You explained by the rotating... Uh, systems, there, there need to be more mass to explain it. So it attracts, why doesn't it collapse onto itself? And could perhaps black holes of dark matter exist? Um, could you? Well, um, I would say that like dark atoms, something like that. So that should first be formed. Um, mm -hmm. I would think that those can exist, those objects. And what people are looking for is, is um, changes in curvature that are not explained by the presence of a black hole or the presence of some, some galaxy. So people are definitely looking for black dark stars or dark galaxies. Mm -hmm. They haven't been formed yet, but that yeah. doesn't mean that they're not existing. Mm -hmm. um, to answer the other part of your question, dark matter, the way that dark matter clumps together is different than the way that ordinary matter clumps together. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't feel um, something that we call radiation pressure. It doesn't feel photons wanting to get mm -hmm. out again. Uh, uh. So the mechanism behind that, again, there are different theories for that. We don't know what mechanism lies beneath it because we don't know what dark matter is. But um, it should, I mean, it can exist. It doesn't mean that, it, uh, that they are not out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. I really like this uh, this topic. And mystery for a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Melissa, do you think in our lives, which are compared to the universe, of course, very short, um, do you think this will be solved? Do you think you will um, <laughs> unravel like the, the, the mystery? What? What? what do you I think? hope. Yes. I hope. I hope so. I yeah. mean, uh, it would be great. I think it's one of the most important questions of, of present day uh, particle physics mm. to understand what is dark matter, what is dark energy and what is gravity. Mm. Mm. Um, but 
I mean, I would. I wish I could look in the future and could tell you, oh, it takes uh, five more years and then we're there. But uh, yep. we don't know. Uh, it has been taken us. I mean, these experiments that are seriously looking for dark matter as a candidate, they have been running since the 80s, 90s, roughly. Mm. Um, they haven't found anything yet. But then again, gravitational waves took 100 years for them to be discovered. Yes. Yeah. 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 Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. No. But I surely hope I yeah. uh, I live that day. <laughs> yeah. 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 I hope so too. It would be fascinating to see um, this discovery. Okay, unfortunately, we have to round off, Melissa. We could talk with you for hours on various several yes. details, but I think you gave a very good overview of the whole subject and um, talked about the experiments to detect it and, and the physics behind it. So it was really fascinating. Um, I want to thank so I want to thank you first for being uh, our guest this evening, and we can perhaps give some kind of digital big hand for uh, for you. Thank you very much for joining us. And please stay stay in the in the connection um, uh, uh, for a while. Then we can talk um, uh, afterwards. Sure. I am going to say goodbye to our audience um, in the field, so to say. Thank you very much for joining. For your great questions. Um, and remember that uh, ten times a year, a dark matter particle will pass your body. That's good to remember. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, and see you uh, see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>